All right, everybody, get comfortable. Time, time to get time to start. Um, so I thought I, I was asked to say a little bit about the protocol. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, say a few words of introduction for a few minutes about Craig. Then Craig will give his speech, and then there will be a Q&A for 10 to 15 minutes. And I, I want to emphasize the Q&A because, unfortunately, after the Q&A, uh, Craig and I are going to have to leave for a press interview. So the Q&A, make sure you ask your, the questions that you have during that Q&A, OK? All right. So, um, so um, all right. So you know that Craig is our capstone speaker. Um, thank you for coming. I, I guess you guys know who he is. You're all here. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I thought, uh, um, you know, I, I found it fascinating. I was reviewing um, uh, Craig's Vita, and, um, you know, it, it's really a, a fascinating story. Um, you know, how do you go from being a rebellious, irreverent surfer, surfer dude, right, to, you know, being a world-famous genomics uh, 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 innovator and visionary and entrepreneur? And... Um, you know, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give the Vita, and I'm gonna start at 1965, Surfer Dude, yes, <laughs> and um, the, I think the most interesting part of the story, which I, I I can only imagine, is is that in 67, 68, he was a corpsman, taking care of injured soldiers doing triage in the Vietnam War, and um, I can only imagine what that's like. Um, you know, I managed to I was a little younger, I managed to avoid that bullet, but um, it clearly was a life-changing event for him, a pivotal event for him, where um, he, he did not lose the rebelliousness and he did not lose the irreverence. He still has those in spades. But he basically, I think, it was one of those transitional events where he realized that he didn't want to waste his, his life. And um, he has obviously not wasted it <laughs> in spades. And I think that's really the story. So what happened then after Vietnam? Um, well, he, he got serious, he went to school, uh, he got a bachelor's degree in his hometown of San Diego, he got a PhD from Nate Kaplan uh, in physiology and pharmacology where he's working on cardiac receptors. He then went and, and walked the academic ladder at SUNY Buffalo, uh, Buffalo from 76 to 84 where he continued to study uh, receptors, both cardiac and neuroreceptors. Um, you know, he's trying to understand the biochemistry and the function at that time. It was very difficult to clone and isolate these things. And I think things really started to take off in 84 when he went to the NIH and became a chief uh, there. And, and, and in the process, he basically got involved in trying to basically analyze these receptors. He got very involved in trying to clone them to basically get genetic access to them. And that really began, I think, his career in genomics. Um, and one of the first innovations at uh, uh, the NIH um, uh, that was done with a young guy by the name of Mark Adams. Mark was a postdoc in his lab. Um, was basically the EST or cDNA approach, um, which really was quite revolutionary. I mean, you guys would probably know it as RNA seq now, but this was the first version of RNA seq, right? And it was suddenly there was a way of basically grabbing the mRNA out of the cell and cloning it, and suddenly seeing all of the genes, right? Because you have to realize this is the Stone Age. You can't, you know, there was no genomes, okay? We had no knowledge of any of the sequences of any of the proteins. And suddenly, there was this treasure trove, right? This fantastic technique. Um, this technique was very successful, and it was commercialized. And off of the, 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 the secondary revenues from that commercialization, Craig then went on to form basically an, a, a private institute, Tiger, which was a, a, a nonprofit institute, uh, uh, the Institute for Genomic Research where he was the president, uh, and he has been the president for the last 25 years. Um, it was there that the genomics thing really started to take off. So in 1995, uh, uh, Craig, uh, together with another cool guy that he picked up by the name of Ham Smith, except in this case, Ham was quite a bit older than Craig. Ham was already, what, 60? 60? 63. 63, okay, he's my age, okay, at the time. But he thought Craig was a hoot, and he got together with Craig, and they came up with this crazy idea to shotgun sequence uh, a free living uh, organism, Haemophilus, a, a two megabase pair of genome. And they did this in 1995. It was a pivotal event. It was the first whole genome shotgun of a living organism. Um, from that success, then, 
He was in 98 to 02, basically Solera was formed. So based on his experience as a, as a leader in genomics, uh, he was asked to be the president and CSO of Solera Genomics, where he, as you know, we basically uh, sequenced the human genome along with a fly and the mouse. And uh, he incidentally picked up another guy, uh, this kind of a compulsive, obsessive mathematician, um, Myers, I think was his name, uh, who joined the company in 98. And uh, uh, also, uh, and I, I think that was really, uh, you know, certainly for me, it was the time of my life. Um, uh, uh, Craig was a, a, a fantastic leader. He's the only person I could have imagined who could have pulled that thing off. Um, but it was an incredible thing. I mean, it was, uh, it was a, a, a rush extraordinaire. Um, so, and as you know, we, we sequence fly, uh, mouse, human, using a paired and whole genome shotgun technique, which is now used basically by everybody. Um, so, after that uh, kind of experience, I think um, many of us kind of wandered around a little bit. Uh, uh, Craig tried, had a TCAG, he had a, a sequencing factory, he had an institute for biological energy alternatives in 02 and 04. Um, and he, he was really starting to think about genomics and, you know, big issues of our time, although he, uh, and, um, and, and thinking about what to do next. And, and one of the things that he did at that time was he basically, he took his private institute, uh, Tiger, and m moved it to San Diego, primarily to San Diego, where it became the J. Craig Venter Institute. And it's actually about to celebrate its 25th year, and he's been the founder, chairman, and CEO of, of JCVI. Uh, uh, throughout that really entire period. And really in trying to then accomplish these larger uh, missions, he's basically, he formed uh, the SGI company, um, uh, Synthetic Genomics Incorporated in 2005, where he was the chairman and the co-CSO. And at SGI, basically they uh, uh, produced the first synthetic <coughs> genome of mycoplasma, so a complete synthetic genome of a living organism. And later on, they even did yeast, which I find really impressive. The yeast genome's 10 megabase pairs. It's, it's no small, small feat in 2012. And then most, his most recent um, foray uh, is Human Longevity Inc., which he founded in 2013 with a number of partners. Um, and uh, as you know, HLI is very interested in human longevity by basically looking at the genotype-phenotype correspondence for human beings, where they've uh, published a paper in PNAS where they've sequenced more than 10,000 uh, uh, human beings. And I, are you going to tell us what the count is now? I imagine it's a lot higher than that, yes. <laughs> it's probably, I'm, I'm guessing it's about 40,000 by now, having seen the, the factory floor. So. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, a, it's an incredible career, an incredible Vita. Um, you know, uh, uh, you, can, you can actually read more, if you're interested in the story, you can read more about it in his books, uh, Life Decoded, which is autobiography. And he's also written a book about the convergence of computing and genomics in the life at the speed of life uh, that was published in 2013. As you can imagine, with a career like this, he's won a few awards, just a few. Uh, uh, he's in the National Academy of Science. He's in the National Academy of Medicine. Um, he, uh, one of his early awards was a uh, German award, was the Paul Ehrlich and Ludwig Darmstädter Prize in 2001, the Gerdner Prize, uh, the Dixon Prize, the Dan David Prize, and most recently the Leuvenhoek Medal, which is only awarded every decade uh, in 2015. And probably the most prestigious is uh, uh, Obama gave him the National Medal of Science in 2008. Um, but the other, you know, so that's an incredible scientific career, but one of the things that I've observed about Craig is that he has an incredible gift, and, and it's really not a, a, a small gift, to be able to take the complex scientific things that we do and basically distill them down to their essence and describe them in a way that people can really understand them. And this is, this is a very important skill. And, and as a result, he's also um, known not only as a world-class scientist, but he's also a um, superstar, right? I mean, he's, he's in the press, he's in the media, in large part because of this skill. And he's been, he's been named Time Magazine's uh, in top 100 list, both in 2007 and 2008. He's America's best leader in US News, the greatest innovator in Business Week, top 25 managers, again, in Business Week. Uh, man of the Year in Financial Times. And, of course, the one that I'm the most jealous of 
is GQ's man of the year. <laughs> okay, anyway, all right, so um, um, hopefully you got an idea of, of who it is that's giving this talk to you today. Um, you know, Craig is a leader and a visionary, and he really sees the big picture, so I'm really looking forward to the talk. Uh, and Craig is really now interested, I think, in the big issues of our time, energy, food, vaccines, longevity, with genomic approaches. And if I might just close with a, a, a personal concept, uh, a comment. I mean, I, I um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not often that um, you get the kind of opportunity that we had at Solera and the, 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 the time that I shared with Craig. Uh, was a very important time with me. Um, you know, I, I, I hope you don't mind, Craig, but I do consider you one of my mentors. I don't know if you noticed, but I watched you very carefully. Um, and I tried in my own small way to emulate you uh, and uh, uh, carry on um, all of the things that you, you've taught me. So um, it is my deepest pleasure and honor um, that Craig has come here to support the opening of our center in our little provincial town. Um, it's really a, a wonderful thing, and uh, without further ado, J. Craig Mentor. I wanted him to just keep going. I was really enjoying it. <laughs> uh, it's such a pleasure to be here on uh, this great occasion to uh, see this new institute opened up. So it's, uh, we need a lot more cooperation and collaboration in the space. And uh, now there's a place to make it happen. So congratulations to Gene and his whole team uh, uh, for doing that. Um, I'll get back to Gene in a few minutes. I want to put him in the right uh, place uh, uh, con conceptually. So we have, we have to work up to that. but. Um, this is actually a picture of the Venture Institute in uh, La Jolla. It's actually on the UCSD campus and overlooks the ocean. So it's a, it's a gorgeous spot. So I, I think he copied it a little bit for this building, but uh, <laughs> he just couldn't get the location quite right. So, uh, but uh, very similar inside, uh, uh, all glass walls everywhere. Uh, there's no place to hide like there is uh, here. You, everybody has glass so everybody can see each other. And believe it or not, I think that leads to uh, more interactions and more collaboration. So uh, again, congrats on that. Uh, and as uh, Gene said, this is our uh, 25th anniversary this year we're celebrating, which makes me uh, feel even older. Um, on the science side, I'd say my whole career has been working towards trying to interpret the genetic code, uh, trying to predict phenotypes from genotype, uh, and you know, including predicting the future. Uh, ultimately, to do that, we decided we had to rewrite the code to be able uh, to prove that. So. I'll walk you through some of that. But the early sequencing that you heard about um, with Haemophilus being the first uh, genome, there are a few viral genomes before that. Uh, uh, Sanger did Phyx in 1977, and there was an RNA virus that was sequenced the year before. Um, other than that, there wasn't much done. Insulin was the first human gene sequenced in 77. So we didn't have a whole lot to go on. But when we started doing whole genomes, uh, I called it digitizing biology. And we started filling the computers with uh, uh, ones and zeros. Uh, so this, I, I don't look like I had more hair then. I just had it in different places uh, today. <laughs> Um, but, but this was the, uh, the cover of science in, uh, in 1995. And you know, we thought we had a totally unique thing with doing true shotgun sequencing of a genome. Uh, Sanger did a pseudo shotgun where we actually did restriction maps 
took the restriction fragments and then sequenced those and then put them back together. But this was a true shotgun where we just literally blew the genome apart and used algorithms to reassemble it. And at the end of this paper, we said that this was a method that the, uh, would be likely used for the human genome. The editors for science really fought that because um, they thought that was bullshit um, because the, the project was heading in a different direction. But uh, uh, it, it, it took a, a, an interesting turn. So we want to ask the question that most people have had, um, depending on your religious background or your belief in fairies, uh, does DNA contain all the information necessary for life? And the way we chose to do that was to see if we could reconstruct, reconstitute life, starting with the ones and zeros in the computer. Uh, to do that, we had to learn how to actually write the genetic code. Also, this assumes that the ones and zeros in the computer are accurate and correct. And it turns out for reading the genetic code, uh, you can get by with pretty sloppy data. Um, I mean, that's why even from the earliest stages with errors sometimes as high as 5%, you could still pretty much work out uh, what the sequence was. Uh, if you have a 5% error, uh, it's usually incompatible with life. So to be able to write the genetic code, we had to have the right code to begin with. So quite often, we had to resequence things uh, to get to that right code. Uh, we started small. Um, those of you who worked with oligonucleotide synthesis, it's an N minus one situation. So the longer the piece of DNA, the more errors there are. Uh, so my colleagues in this were Ham Smith, who got the Nobel Prize in 1978 for discovering restriction enzymes, and Clyde Hutchinson, who was retiring from UNC, uh, one of the early developers of site-directed mutagenesis. So. Um, the, the nice thing about hiring people that are past retirement age, and that's why I've, I love the early retirement age in, in Europe, because we get really fantastic postdocs. Uh, <laughs> but these postdocs come at a level where they're not so worried about their next job. Uh, they just want to do really good science, and that's all they're focused on. So. Um, they, uh, they work hard on it. And so this team developed a way to correct the errors that came about from doing DNA synthesis. And we chose PhiX uh, historically, because it was the first DNA virus uh, sequenced. And uh, Clyde actually worked in Sanger's lab as part of the sequence. And I always carried a vial of PhiX-174 in his pocket just to prove that scientists are weird. Um, and uh, so we had one of the original sources to go back and sequence uh, for comparison. But it took us uh, two weeks to design and build the oligos, put them together, and correct the errors. And the next challenge came with uh, injecting uh, the synthetic piece of DNA into E. coli. But as soon as we did, uh, we had a pleasant surprise of uh, all these clear spots, which means there was active virus there, and the virus was killing uh, E. coli cells. So if you did this without error correction, if you just took oligonucleotides, put them together with polymerase, even with amplification by infectivity, which is millions-fold amplification, you don't get a single uh, viable virus. So the error correction in getting the letters correct that is really key. So we call this uh, the situation where the software is building its own hardware. We put in a piece of chemical software. We ended up with these viral particles that uh, uh, will, on their own, infect E. coli and make millions, if not billions, of copies of themselves. Now, we wanted to go further. We wanted to make an entire bacterial chromosome. Uh, but going from 5,000 bases up to 
1.1 million was not an easy jump. Uh, it took uh, close to a decade. Uh, and we had to develop all these uh, new techniques uh, along the way for handling larger and larger pieces. For example, unless you're working in this space, you, you don't know that you cannot pipette large pieces of DNA. Once you're over 100,000 base pairs, DNA gets very brittle and uh, pipetting it just shears it. So you certainly can't pipette entire chromosomes. So we have to do everything in gel blocks. When we take the chromosome out of the cell, we lyse it into a gel block. Uh, we do all the enzyme treatments in, in these gel blocks and then ultimately release the chromosome uh, uh, from that. Uh, we had to correct uh, errors. We had to find ways to assemble all these pieces uh, uh, together. Um, so I, I will skip all those steps and just give you a, a very quick simplistic overview. So we made 1,000 base pair pieces, and we could get those with very high fidelity. We put 10 of those together to get 10 KB pieces. And at each stage, we'd resequence them, uh, checking them for uh, uh, accuracy. And if they weren't 100% accurate, we remade them. We then put 10 of those 10 KB pieces together uh, to make 100 KB pieces. And we made 11 100 KB pieces, uh, resequenced them, uh, and they were all valid. But they were too big to handhold. But we found this really neat trick. If we just put them into uh, yeast along uh, with a short piece of vector, uh, yeast using homologous recombination would put all these pieces together for us and assemble the entire chromosome. The only issue is we now had our prokaryotic chemis, uh, chromosome inside a eukaryotic cell and had to work on ways uh, to purify that out. So we had two teams. We had this team working on chemistry and another one working on biology. And the, the team on chemistry ended up being uh, uh, led by Ham Smith, but uh, Dan Gibson um, was the one who really made a leap. And many of you have used what we call the Gibson assembly. So putting these pieces together was very laborious. And uh, he found that he could do them all at a single temperature in a single pot. And he came in to talk to Ham and I. And he said, uh, I don't know what took you old guys so long. <laughs> so he took something that took days to do down to minutes. And it really. Uh, sped up everything because it allowed automation of, of the process, which we'll get back to. So on the biology side, the trick was getting chromosomes in and out of bacterial cells. Now, it's really easy with a eukaryotic cell. You can just pop out the nuclei and move it to another cell. And we do that all the time uh, when we're trying to make new pigs for uh, organ transplantation, but for bacterial cells, you can't do that. Uh, you can't just pick up the chromosome. Uh, so we had to develop some clever ways to do it. What we used uh, was the knowledge of restriction enzymes and made sure that there was a differential set in our synthetic chromosome and the chromosome in the recipient cell. Uh, we used this gel and electroporation to insert the synthetic chromosome in the recipient cell. And so now we have a cell that has the body of one species, but it has two sets of genetic instructions. What we think happened in a short period of time, uh, the new DNA started to be read, enzymes produced. Some of the early ones were restriction enzymes that recognized the chromosome in the cell as foreign DNA and chewed it up. Uh, and that created a situation where we now have the body of one species and the genetic software of another. Uh, in a short period of time, we ended up with these totally new cells. When we interrogated them, there wasn't a single molecule of the original recipient cell left. Everything in the cell, every protein, every molecule, 
came either directly from the synthetic piece of DNA or a, a, a um, end result of the proteins being made in those cells. So this was published in 2010. This was actually the control experiment because we used largely uh, mycoplasma mycoides. We made some changes, um, but it was largely based on a known life form. But there were so many variants that we had to start with uh, something uh, known. We added some things to it uh, to prove that it was a synthetic cell. We came up with a new code where we could write the entire English language with numbers and punctuation in the genetic code. And uh, it's not new to do that. People have been using ASCII code forever to do that. But uh, ASCII code uh, uh, is not good uh, for biology. If you wrote out uh, the name of this new institute and Gene Myers that could create a new biotoxin that uh, you know, just killed bald people or something. And uh, so our code puts in very frequent stop codons so we don't inadvertently make some new uh, biopeptide. Uh, the code in the genome uh, first uh, told you how to decode the code and then gave you a URL that if you decoded it to send an email message to saying that you achieved that and I told you how to read the rest, which contained the names of all 42 scientists that contributed to it, uh, names of institutions, and I added uh, three quotations from the literature that uh, uh, seemed appropriate. So uh, uh, the first is from James Joyce, to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. You know, that somehow seemed appropriate. The second is from American Prometheus, uh, Oppenheimer's biography, what he heard from a teacher early on, uh, see things not as they are, but as they might be. And the third is from Richard Feynman, what I cannot build, I can't understand. Uh, after this was broadly uh, uh, translated, I think the, uh, the first email came in in less than 10 hours. It was pretty stunning how quickly people can decode out there. Um, but after the translation was broadly in the press, one of the early things we got was a letter from James Joyce, a state attorney, <laughs> asking if we had permission to use that quotation. Um, I don't know what German law is, but American law is you can use up to a, a paragraph with attribution uh, without permission. So. We dismissed uh, uh, that one. <laughs> and then we started getting emails from a Caltech scientist saying we had misquoted uh, Feynman. <laughs> and we sent him the quotations we found on the internet. And, and finally, to prove his point, uh, he dug into the Caltech archives. Um, oh, I went the wrong way. Um, and uh, where there was a picture of Feynman's blackboard when he wrote his original quotation, which was, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So I guess his biographer thought that was kind of a boring quote. He jazzed it up a little bit. But I think the original is much better. And you'll see in, in a few minutes why this is true. Um, you have to understand it to be able to build it. Um, and by trying to build it, it'll show you what you don't understand. So we went back and edited the genome uh, so that Feynman will rest happily. Uh, so we wanted to go to this next stage of actually designing a genome from scratch. You know, we had plagiarized the first one uh, from nature. But from all the studies that we had done from 95, we published two genomes. Bioinformaticians subtracted them from each other. Uh, but there's literally hundreds of papers in the literature since then of people looking at all kinds of uh, microbial species and listing what they thought were the minimal essential gene set. So even we started to believe this. And so we set up a contest 
between SGI and, and JCVI to uh, design a cell, uh, and whichever one worked was going to get a big prize. So we started down this uh, road, and uh, uh, none of them worked. Um, so that, that wasn't uh, very helpful. Um, so we had to start adding back uh, genes. And so we sort of made this designed uh, build uh, a component. So trust me, it's not easy each time you want to do an experiment to build a 1.1 million base pair uh, genome. But we got very good at it, and we did it in sections of eight so that we could change uh, and modify one section uh, and then use the uh, uh, other uh, 11 components. So we went through this, adding uh, back genes until we could get to a living cell. And then we went in the other direction uh, with uh, transposon insertion and other methods to see which of those genes could then be eliminated. And we got down to a minimal uh, a genome. Um, and I think every microbial species you do this with, there'll be a different answer. Uh, so uh, we, we got down to 473 genes. But the big surprise, and the reason it took so long to do, about a third of the genes, 149 genes, uh, were of uh, complete unknown function. All we knew is if that gene wasn't present, uh, we couldn't get a living cell. We expected two to three percent, uh, just based on the unknown fraction in each genome, and that this set of subtractions that everybody had been doing for years uh, was actually true. But it just shows you when you just look at the same thing over and over again with the same eyes in the same way, you'll get the same answer. And if you don't look at it from a different vantage point, uh, you won't see that you've been fooling yourself. So uh, missing uh, the function uh, of a third of the genes essential for life of the simplest cell was a huge surprise. Um, and the team has now uh, been working on those. Um, this is a picture of uh, what we call SYN 3.0. Uh, it divides very rapidly, and billions of copies uh, have been made. Um, but uh, we, we've probably learned what a little over a third of those unknown genes do. In some cases, you can just line them up, and they're clearly transmembrane protein transporters, but that doesn't tell you what it transports. And getting things in and out of the cell is obviously uh, one of the steps that's essential uh, uh, for life. Um, so we think it's actually a, a great uh, platform. Um, everybody got a copy of, of this book at, at the Institute. If, if you read that, there's quotations from uh, a Frenchman going back to the 1700s who said, give me basic protoplasm and I will recreate uh, all of life. So they didn't even know what was in the protoplasm. They didn't know about proteins. Uh, but they believed that the essential pieces of life were inside each cell. And once that was understood, you could recreate all of life. So we think we can add uh, cassettes back to this minimal genome. Uh, in theory, you should be able to recapitulate evolution uh, and create uh, higher species uh, from uh, this minimal set. When we look at the unknown genes, uh, they go across uh, the evolutionary tree. They're not just some bizarre rare set uh, in the mycoplasmas. The other things we're doing is we're trying to defrag uh, the genomes. Because if we want to make cells by design, it'd be so much easier just to have a cassette for glycolysis, a, you know, a, uh, a cassette for methanogenesis, et cetera. Um, 
And we're actually quite surprised, as long as you know where the regulatory regions are, just to completely redesign the cell and put genes in a logical order, put them in sets of uh, like functioning genes. Initially, microbiologists and early molecular biologists, because of uh, a, a few studies in E. coli, uh, you know, thought that everything was going to be extremely highly or ordered because there were few sets of genes that had interdependence. But in fact, uh, after four billion years of evolution, things are pretty random with all these changes. Uh, so if we're getting to rational design, we at least now know it's possible uh, uh, to do this. But this just shows you for even for a one eighth segment, that's how many changes and rearrangements we have to make uh, just to get to uh, an ordered set. Now, we just had a paper come out yesterday um, that the papers describe early on in this book, Life at the Speed of Light. And we've called it a digital biological converter because it can take digital information either through the internet or through uh, radio waves. Uh, the digital information in the form of a DNA sequence. And at the other end, if you have a box at the other end, you can convert it back into uh, a living uh, material. So uh, we've made uh, uh, proteins, we've made RNA, we've made uh, viruses, we've made vaccines, and you can send the sequence uh, for one of these cells and remake the cell at the other end. So um, in the book, I describe that it'd be much faster to send biology to and from Mars uh, by the speed of light instead of some slow Elon Musk rocket ship. Uh, so uh, event eventually, the rocket boys will catch up with uh, what's actually uh, uh, possible. Uh, this is actually. Uh, the, the prototype and the picture of, of the first one, uh, DARPA was actually funding some of this work. And they were all excited about doing a test. And they proposed doing it on Air Force One that we were going to send up uh, Phi X-174 uh, by radio wave to Air Force One until somebody told them that Phi X was actually a virus. <laughs> And uh, then they told us we had to uh, take the word virus out of the application and just put Phi-X or phage. Um, but basically, once they knew it was a virus, uh, they didn't want the press release of success successfully sending a virus uh, up, up to Air Force One, although people might be much more interested in trying that today. Um, <laughs> Uh, just because of the strong interest in science. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, this is a machine of the future because, uh, for example, we were using this to send uh, the new uh, flu vaccine around. In fact, when uh, the latest uh, epidemic broke out in China, a group in China sequenced it, posted it to a special internet site. We downloaded it and synthesized the entire virus and vaccine the next day. And so Synthetic Genomics was the only site in the U.S. for about two years to actually have uh, the H7N9 uh, virus, and we <coughs> provided it to the CDC. Uh, and to Novartis uh, and to, to other parts of the U.S. government. Uh, and it led uh, very rapidly to a vaccine. Um, we got FDA approval for the first synthetic DNA-based vaccine, uh, and they stockpiled uh, a fair amount of it. Um, there's still been more H7N9 outbreaks, but none have occurred yet in the U.S. But if these boxes existed everywhere, um, you could send a new vaccine around the world in a fraction 
uh, of a second, but that's just a little side story. So going on from small species to trying to think about ourselves, uh, we have a different context for that now. You know that your DNA software is the software of life. Uh, it codes for everything. Um, and what that everything is can be uh, uh, much more complex. But um, it all started back uh, with the sequencing of the human genome. And um, your le leader here, uh, Gene Myers, was not just an important part of this project. He was absolutely essential. Uh, he and his team wrote over uh, half a million lines of software code in less than six months. Um, and it was high risk business. Uh, we had sequenced the Drosophila genome and we were doing the very first test of his algorithm uh, that finished just a few hours before we were supposed to present this at the fly meeting. So had it not worked, it would have been on the world news what a spectacular failure it was. But this was actually the first test. There weren't any partial tests or anything else. This was building it, plugging it in, and running it. And uh, uh, fortunately, the Drosophila genome came out the other end. Um, he then modified and did the same thing for human. But let, let me backtrack a, a little bit. I'd known Gene for a long time. He'd written even some theoretical papers on doing shotgun sequencing and why it was logical. And uh, uh, this was even after we sequenced the first genome using shotgun sequencing. Uh, but the rest of the genomics community was, uh, uh, was not buying it. Um, I started getting phone calls uh, from somebody pretending to be at Applied Biosystems. And they said they wanted to give me $300 million to sequence the human genome. And I thought they were joking, so I hung up on them. Uh, they kept trying to call back and then showed up in person, um, uh, said they were real, and wanted me to go look at their new prototype uh, capillary sequencer. So I flew out to Foster City, and uh, uh, it, it was pieces of a machine separated over four separate buildings. But it was very clear that it was going to work. I think it was going to have the potential to work extremely well. So I, I went back uh, to the Venture Institute and uh, sat down with Ham Smith, described what I saw. And I said, look, they're giving me $300 million to do this experiment. I have to go do it. Uh, will you come? And, he, and his response was, I don't think it will work, but I'm going with you. Um, <laughs> which was an essential part. As soon as we let it be known that we were putting this together and we were looking for people, um, I, I think we, we sent a note uh, uh, to Gene, but um, he was enthusiastic about the project. And uh, so I called him up and said, you know, we'll, we'll pay you a full-time salary. Come here. You know, what do you want? He goes, just just match my university salary, and I'll, I'll be there in two weeks. Um, the next day, he called me back, and he said, I understand industry pays more than <laughs> academia. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time we finished that conversation, he was getting three times his <laughs> academic salary. Um, and I said, are we all settled now? He said, yeah, we're settled. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be there in less than a week. <laughs> um, he called me back the next day. He goes, what are stock options? <laughs> <laughs> he was getting advice from somebody, but they were, they were slow to give out the advice, apparently. <laughs> so, uh, by the time he was a multimillionaire on paper and a big salary, uh, he decided he was actually satisfied and was going to come. And uh, had he not done that, it, we would have absolutely failed at what we were trying to do. So the reason uh, 
we and others described the experience there. It was a team, well, we had about 1,000 employees. The key team was about 250. Uh, that if any person, any component of the team failed, the whole thing would have failed. But the radical new piece that we were depending on uh, was the new algorithm that uh, uh, Gene had in his brain and led a team to put together. So um, not only did you get a good negotiator here, uh, you got somebody who actually is a truly mathematical genius. And uh, uh, had he not done it, we, we probably still would not have uh, the, the human genome. So thank you, Gene, for uh, all that you've done. He, he wanted to be on the cover, so that's his baby photo. <laughs> uh, it's really not. <laughs> um, but this is the team uh, when we were at the White House uh, in 2000 uh, to announce the first genome with uh, President Obama and, uh, and the, uh, the head of the UK. Um, and here's the same team 10 years uh, later ce celebrating the first anniversary. So uh, um, a few people had a little bit more hair on their faces than they had then. So, but uh, otherwise still intact. Uh, Ham is 85 and works every day in the lab. And, uh, uh, is doing fantastic. So what are we trying to do that's different today with understanding the human genome? So clearly in 2000, 2001, having one or two or even a handful of copies of different genomes was interesting because the main news, if you go back and look, was that there was only 20,000 something genes, because uh, some people expected there to be hundreds of thousands. Um, geneticists aren't necessarily the brightest group, because they tend to think very linearly. And, and as a group, they really wanted there to be a gene for every trait and function. Uh, and it's even a problem today dealing with genetic counselors trying to take genome information and give it back to patients because they're trained in one gene at a time uh, for, a given, uh, for a given trait. Um, but it, it's clearly much more uh, complex. So we were waiting. The first genome we did cost $100 million. Uh, that wasn't very replicable. The computer we built uh, for Gene's experiment cost $50 million uh, and was only one and a half teraflops. So you can buy a teraflop card for your PC for about $100 today. Uh, sequencing has changed uh, even more. Uh, in addition to the pace of change in computing, uh, where it became highly distributed, uh, but also um, machine learning uh, became into being of practical use. Pulled the trigger for us to start human longevity a little over three years ago. Sequencing was below $2,000 a genome, uh, and the compute seemed relatively cheap. So we're using this as a process to try and change medicine from being what it is of reactive you get symptoms, you go see your clinician, you go to the hospital, uh, whereas we'll show you it can be preventative, it can be predictive, it can be extremely personalized, um, and um, I think this change can happen relatively rapidly if we want it to. Um, this is probably the worst news you're going to get today. Um, most of you are quite not in this group, but uh, it, it pretty much applies. If you're between 50 and 74 and a male in the U.S., 
40% will never see the age of 74. If you're a female, 28% won't see the age of 74. Uh, the statistics in most part of the world are worse. I think Europe might be marginally better. But two-thirds of that risk for both males and females is cancer and heart disease. So if we could predict early on, uh, prevent cancer and heart disease, we would shift that whole uh, curve. So this looks at the death curves for uh, uh, the, the last century, where the median age uh, was 57. Now it's uh, out to 84 people uh, born in the last uh, decade. But you can see, once you get past 90, we're still in very, very small percentages of the population that reach that. Now, everybody knows somebody that's 90, so you think, well, that's not unusual. Um, but, you know, three-fourths of the population that they were uh, raised with uh, are already dead. Uh, we think we can shift that curve. Um, but the goal is not to move the line out to here. We're not trying to make people live to 150 or 200. We're trying to increase the healthy lifespan. So whatever a normal lifespan is, uh, it can be lived largely disease-free, and uh, you can lead a productive, healthy life. So sequencing has changed a little bit in these 17 years. Each of these boxes, uh, and these not, not even the newest ones that we just got, they're about a million dollars each. And each one of these boxes is 1,350 times uh, what all of Solera could do in a year. So at Solera, we had 350 machines working around the clock. Uh, one of these boxes is 1,350 times that output. So things have changed. We have a a room uh, uh, full of these, and we have two more rooms we're building out to expand it uh, to where we would have the capacity to do a million genomes a year. Um, the, the trouble is with, with data, so we've done uh, a little over uh, 40,000 genomes. Uh, gene, it was a good guess. Um, just in terms of ACGs and Ts, uh, that's about six petabytes of uh, just ACGs and Ts. So if we had uh, 10 million genomes, it would be an exabyte of genome data, uh, not to mention all the other data that we're adding to it. Right now, it uh, uh, doesn't hum ma matter how many nodes you have, I don't think you can handle exabyte uh, computing here. Um, we use Amazon Cloud. <coughs> we pushed it to its absolute uh, uh, limits. Um, we're one of the top 1% users of Amazon. We're up there with video streamers and porn sites. <laughs> um, uh, but we use a lot more CPUs than either of them do. Um, and we wanted to reanalyze just 10,000 genomes, and they didn't have the excess CPUs to do that. So an experiment that should have taken two hours uh, took two weeks. So trying to get up into exabyte computing, Moore's Law has got to pick it up a little bit if it's going to keep up with, uh, uh, with genome data today. So we did an analysis of the first 10,000 genomes um, <clears throat> just to check on accuracy and a number of things. And a, number of surprises uh, came out of this. Um, one of them was that there's a lot of confusion what a genome is, even in the scientific literature. Uh, so we sequenced to a 30x coverage, which means every base pair in the uh, meaningful genome gets covered 10 times. But last year, there was a paper uh, published in Nature from the uh, UK 10,000 Genome Project uh, that said it was the genome of 1,000 uh, 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 people. Turns out it was sequenced from 1,000 genomes. It wasn't 1,000 genomes. 
uh, and the genomes averaged 23% coverage. So uh, the journal uh, editors are sort of like uh, tabloid editors now, trying to expand the headlines uh, to sell more uh, journals. Even with all the sequencing we do, the genome is not completely covered. The blue areas are where you have high quality coverage. The gray areas are where it's much lower quality due to highly repetitive data. Uh, we have various long reads that go across these. We know the distance of them. Uh, fortunately, there's no genes in any of these regions. So in the blue areas, we have very low false positives and false negatives. So uh, uh, this is data we're using with the FDA to show that genome sequencing is actually works quite well. One of the biggest surprises to me was that we saturated all the common variants in the human population uh, with a little over 8,000 human genomes. Um, so all the things that uh, uh, 23 million others measure on their gene ships uh, that are virtually shared by everybody uh, just fell out very quickly. What we find now, if we sequence anybody's genome, we'll find on the average of 8,000 variants unique to that person, at least unique thus far uh, in the data sets uh, that we have. When we look at the genome, uh, just statistically looking for sites of information, we we're looking to see if there was an unmutable part of the genome. Wherever you see these down spikes means uh, the genome cannot tolerate variation there, uh, which means if there's a variant at one of those sites, it probably leads to a spontaneous abortion uh, or just lack of viability from the beginning. From this pattern, uh, we can work out uh, just with unknown data, whether it's likely to be clinically significant or not. Uh, some of these are pretty obvious, so we put together a 23,000 transmembrane uh, receptors and transporters, and it became uh, very clear that the most uh, problematic area is the transmembrane domain itself, obviously a uh, mutation, a frame shift that leads to a charged amino acid would be, lead to a loss of function mutation just by popping that out of the membrane. Um, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, the uh, outside uh, mutations don't matter very much, um, but we all know of examples where there are a few sites where they do. Now, this slide might be very upsetting to, to Gene and others with, who like to play with mice um, or human cell lines. Uh, we find that extrapolating data from gene knockouts in mice or studies on human cell lines don't correlate with the essential population we find by actually studying humans. Uh, this should not be that surprising to people. As soon as you put a cell line in culture, it starts mutating like crazy uh, and does not represent even the host after a short time in culture. Um, so I've been against model systems other than for some fundamental understanding. If you really want to know what's going on in humans, <laughs> You can't study mice. You have to study humans. And you can't use cell lines as surrogates other than to get hints. So uh, obviously this would change uh, the, the scope of NIH funding uh, because this sort of looks like the distribution of funding. Very little goes to work directly in humans and it's almost all for model systems. And it makes sense in terms of looking at essential genes. Um, you know, when you get uh, a variance in essential genes, obviously uh, the pathogenicity uh, is much greater than it is throughout the rest of the genome. 
Now we can use some of this data very quickly and we have some phenomenal tools. One is called uh, HLI search that can search uh, all 40,000 genomes in about 200 milliseconds. Um, and you'll be able to play with this uh, soon. There's a site now with the 10,000 genomes that you can play with the version of it. Uh, but we use this clinically and it's, uh, it's a remarkable tool. So we can, this was a rare patient brought to us from Children's Hospital, uh, a, a young boy with, uh, if you can read MRIs, his brain is obviously uh, quite scrambled. It's more surprising to me that he's alive than uh, being relatively normal and his body is covered with these uh, small uh, tumors. Uh, we got a trio, we sequenced his parents' genome as well as his genome, and things became relatively clear cut just on sequencing the parents' genome. Uh, it became clear that they were very closely related to each other. Where you see these uh, uh, dark bands, uh, dark orange bands, those are regions where the parents have virtually the same exact sequence. So we checked to see how related they were. They were actually second cousins, uh, not first cousins, but they came from a small village in Mexico that had a lot of inbreeding, uh, and that shows up clearly. And what this does, as everybody knows, is if you have uh, rare alleles, but uh, What's unusual is for both parents to be ca carrying blocks of them uh, that leads to uh, major changes. And this is where we found all the uh, fundamental genes associated with brain abnormalities. Uh, the other gene that showed up that was sort of stuck out was the NF1 or neurofibromatosis 1 gene. You probably know this as the elephant man's gene. Uh, so we were curious about that, and it turns out neither parent had that mutation. So it was a spontaneous mutation. So you can understand maybe why 30 kids in the world have this disorder. First, they have to have highly inbred parents that have those common variants that lead to the brain disruption and have a spontaneous mutation in the NF1 gene at the same time. Um, but I use this to illustrate that uh, you can't just look to your parents to understand yourselves. They're good hints, but when we sequence multiple sperm cells or multiple egg cells, no two sperm cells are the same, no two egg cells are the same. On top of that, we all get several hundred to several thousand spontaneous mutations that truly make us unique. So it doesn't whether it Aunt Millie lived to be 105, smoking six cigars a day and drinking a quarter booze, uh, or, or both your parents did, uh, that doesn't mean it applies to you. And the only way to find out what applies to you is to have your own genome uh, and to start to understand that, because uh, uh, the genome is full of surprises. We spend a lot of time on cancer. We have a, uh, uh, two cancer programs to help people that already have cancer, and then I'll describe uh, a much more important program. So this is our comprehensive cancer program where uh, we sequence the person's entire germline genome. We sequence the uh, terminal tumor genome to a 90x coverage. Uh, we sequence the immune cell uh, repertoire we actually isolate T cells from the tumor uh, and characterize those in culture by taking uh, the identified neoantigens, we make peptides for these, and then we find out which of the T cells uh, recognize uh, those peptides. Uh, and then those are used uh, by us in testing and others uh, trying to make uh, anti-tumor uh, vaccines. Sometimes we look at liquid biopsies and a few other things. We find liquid biopsies correspond to the tumor DNA less than 50% of the time. 
So we don't think it's going to be a panacea uh, uh, for uh, looking at this. Here's just one example, a man in his uh, 50s, just looking at his genome. He had three mutated oncogenes. He had a couple of mutations in genes associated with his immune system. And his microbiome said he had HPV-16 present. I'd say this is a person, it's going to be when, not if, he gets cancer. Uh, he got head and neck cancer. Uh, it didn't respond to much. Uh, we saw him uh, at late stage. Uh, we found the total tumor burden. He had 25,000 mutations in his tumor and 315 uh, neoantigens, so proteins with the sequence actually uh, uh, changed. Uh, we take everything into uh, uh, a look at pathways and we came up with a number of possible drugs that uh, should have worked, uh, but because he was uh, not doing well, uh, he was randomly switched to a, uh, a, uh, a uh, um, immune uh, therapy that uh, our predictions from immune sequencing, he would not do well on it. But one of the problems with clinical trials, once people get locked into them, nobody wants to change even though there's other information. But that's the depth of the information we get. Uh, we have another program that does almost as much, but it does it just with exome sequencing uh, instead of full genome sequencing. And uh, our goal is to start to make uh, vaccines, both as a preventative vaccine uh, and also as a therapeutic vaccine. So we will be trying uh, both of those. Our biggest problem was we started out from the beginning not just wanting DNA sequence. My view, DNA sequence on its own is like having one hand clapping. We wanted as much phenotype and clinical data on each person. We're doing all kinds of clinical trials for major pharmaceutical companies, and we got limited phenotype data from them. We've done a large number of academic collaborations where uh, the academic groups characterize the phenotype in depth, but in a very narrow fashion. So we decided to set up our own phenotyping clinic that we call the Health Nucleus, uh, where we do a, a very large number of tests. Um, including whole body MRI, concent uh, concentrating on, on the, uh, the brain. Uh, we do the whole genome. Uh, we do the microbiome, the metabolome. Uh, we do DEXA scan. Uh, we do CT scans for uh, heart, uh, a number of cognitive tests, et cetera, and a, a number of pulmonary tests. These were done initially just to get phenotype uh, data. We only had, quote, normal people coming in. We uh, didn't want anybody who was sick. If they were already sick, they were supposed to go to the hospital. But from day one, we started making major diagnoses of uh, people with uh, cancer, people with heart disease. And one of the reasons for this, we have a whole new technique in MRI uh, that is really fantastic. It's called restriction spectrum imaging. And it makes use of looking at water molecules in different tissues. For example, with tumors, the nuclei are slightly larger. They have more water in them, but the water is more restricted in its motion. And so on the MRI with the post-processing, tumors literally light up uh, quite clearly in our images. Um, and this is in contrast to what happened in the 70s when CT scanning first came out. There were thousands and thousands of CT scanners. Everybody had whole body CT scans. And CT is just an x-ray. And so you saw a bump or something, but you had no idea whether it was cancerous or not. Today, we can tell whether or not there's a tumor. For example, with prostate cancer, Here's a study that was recently published uh, by guys on our team where straight from the MRI, uh, they diagnosed and graded the tumor uh, that the pathology uh, matched uh, perfectly. 
Uh, in fact, here's one that's blown up that you can see uh, that with normal MRI, uh, this would not show up. Um, but what's fantastic is what's done now, and I went through this myself, you get random biopsies around the prostate gland to see if there's cancer there. Um, this was down on the edge, so it might have uh, been missed. Um, but with the new MRI images, these go right into uh, uh, the operating room along with ultrasound, and the images can be overlapped. So these exact spots can be biopsied versus just doing random biopsy. Um, so it's a very useful technique. Uh, we find a variety of things. Uh, uh, this was a great fruit size ovarian cyst that a woman did not know uh, she had. Uh, these are quite dangerous because they can just twist and usually they present with women having massive internal bleeding uh, uh, from these. But some of the more interesting things is we can actually measure the, your metabolism straight from the MRI image. So liver fat is something everybody should know what your measurement is. MRI is one of the few ways uh, to get it. Normal liver fat is 4% or less. We've had people presenting with as high as 38%. No symptoms, no awareness, but likelihood that they'll need a liver transplant within a few years. Uh, there's a disease called NASH where it's associated with uh, uh, non-alcoholic uh, a disease, so it's not just drinking alcohol that makes this worse. Uh, and we just published a paper on this showing changes uh, with the microbiome. But this is quite labile. Um, I went on a 30 mile bike ride with one of the world's experts on organ fat. And uh, we stopped for a break at 15 miles, and he said, You know, uh, exercise won't get rid of your organ fat. I said, what the hell? You couldn't have told me that 15 miles ago. <laughs> uh, and uh, the only thing that does is calorie restriction. But obviously, exercise uh, helps with that. But it's a really a big deal. A number of people have totally changed their lifestyles and changed these numbers. Um, because you can go in the MRI every day because there's no radiation or risk because we don't use any contrast media because of this new technique. Um, I found out after uh, uh, last, end of last year's holiday season that my liver fat went from three to seven. So I, I found out how I could make it go up very quickly, uh, <laughs> alcohol and rich food, but uh, it does go back down if you work hard in the other uh, direction. So we measured this across uh, the body. Uh, so we measure your exact organ fat. Um, but these are the kind of pictures we get without contrast media of your vascular system. Uh, so think, for comparing to the genome, we can get exact measurements of blood vessels. And with machine learning, find out which genetic components uh, code for that. Uh, but also, we can diagnose diseases uh, here's a woman who had an aneurysm um, that usually people learn they have brain aneurysms uh, because they die suddenly uh, from having them. They burst and uh, uh, almost everybody knows somebody that's died from a, from a brain aneurysm. These are now fixed as an outpatient in less than an hour uh, with just a stent. We get these incredible pictures of uh, your brain a neuroquant is a program that's better than any neuropathologist that measures very precisely the volumes of uh, uh, 11 uh, different brain regions. Uh, and you can all learn to diagnose Alzheimer's disease very easily. So here's the hippocampus of a normal person. So we actually calculate the exact volume of that. But you don't need to do a calculation on this one with the Alzheimer's disease. There's a huge void around it and the hippocampus is substantially uh, degenerated. So between these kinds of images and genomics, we can predict up to 20 years in advance 
uh, before your first uh, symptoms. We also find all kinds of things in people's brains. This is a meningioma. That's a vascular tumor. Uh, again, they cause problems uh, by bleeding. Uh, here's a, another one, a cavernoma. Again, it's a, a vascular tumor uh, that mimic uh, uh, strokes. The cardiovascular, we're using now remote sensing. Uh, we give people a patch to wear. We do cardiac CT. Uh, we do 4D echo, where we can generate these kinds of pictures. So you can see all four chambers of the heart. And you can actually look down uh, any of the blood vessels. You can get precise measurements, but you can see how the valves are working. We measure Doppler shifts, so we know whether there's any regurgitation. But think of all these imaging pictures of taking precise measurements off to work back to find the genomic components of it. This is just from a CT uh, photo. This is actually my heart. I, I use this for HR meetings to prove that I have one. Uh, <laughs> you, you, might, you might try that, Gene. It's, uh, uh, but uh, there's some technology that's very close in the MRI to actually be able to see inside the coronary vessels. So the same technique that can measure whether you have cancer, whether you have Alzheimer's, whether you have aneurysms, what your metabolic state is, uh, very soon we'll be able to also uh, predict cardiac function. With this remote patch, uh, we've made a number of diagnoses with it as we're collecting data. A number of people have episodic atrial fibrillation for up to eight hours a day and don't know it. That means they're extremely high risk for stroke. So they're now on anticoagulants. One of the most interesting cases was a man who had second degree heart block. His heart rate would go down to less than 20 beats a minute. And he was unaware of it. Um, he, uh, we learned this on a Friday. We thought we could wait till Monday to tell him. But he was at such high risk for sudden death that uh, uh, we, we called him right away, and he uh, got a pacemaker installed uh, quite quickly. So th this is the kind of computation now we can do uh, uh, from the whole body MRI. It gives you your exact muscle mass. We can tell you how much each we leg weighs if you want, how much organ fat you have, what your organ fat to peripheral fat ratio is. And so this is really useful data if you're trying to get control over your own body uh, versus the parameters that are given without uh, being able to measure things. So we're discovering things in about 40% of, quote, healthy people that come to the health nucleus uh, because we're detecting disease early. We're detecting cancer in 2.5% of people that uh, are completely unaware that they have it. In the U.S., a million and a half people get diagnosed with cancer. They didn't get it just the hour before the diagnosis. Sometimes they've had it for weeks, sometimes for months, sometimes for years. Uh, the trick is, with all the cases now, and we've been 100% accurate on diagnosing uh, these high-grade cancers, is every one of them has been uh, treatable, and all individuals are cancer-free. Um, Two of the people are ones that have been mentioned here. I was diagnosed with high-grade prostate cancer uh, in my own MRI and had uh, surgery to remove it uh, just before it had started to metastasize. In uh, Ham Smith, uh, because we had everybody in the institute go through, we found a fist-sized tumor in his lungs. Uh, it turned out to be a lymphoma. Uh, extremely rapidly growing one, so it responded well to chemotherapy and then to radiation. Uh, and he's now back, his hair's grown back, and he's back working as an 85-year-old every day in the lab. The, the chemo uh, really knocked him down and was tough for him to get through. Uh, his physician said that we had not discovered it when we did, he would have been dead in six weeks. So. We get these cases brought to us, like we now have four women in their 30s 
with stage four colon cancer. So the guidelines don't really help them of waiting till you're 50 to get a colonoscopy. Discovering cancer before it's metastasized, where every one of them has been treatable and apparently curable, is far more satisfying than anything else we do. I mean, it's really changing the focus of just trying to do uh, the science and correlating with the genome, although in every case we do try and correlate it uh, with the genes. Um, when we can, uh, it, it shows up pretty quickly with known things, uh, but we're now getting enough cases, for example, of distended aortas where we found a gene duplication that seems to correlate with that and makes it predictive in the future. So we're using machine learning. I'll give you one quick example of how that's worked out. Um, uh, in the genome report, we uh, predict people's height, their weight, their BMI, their eye color, hair color, uh, and a picture of you. Um, I was on, I don't know if you watch Chelsea Handler here in Germany. Uh, she's a female comedian. Um, she wanted her results live on television. So I showed her her data, and uh, uh, I said, it predicts that you're going to weigh 160 pounds. Her, her response was, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, we don't all have to achieve our genomic potential. <laughs> the, the problem in America is most people are exceeding their genomic potential, but uh, uh, these are lifestyle choices. But, the face study, we had a thousand volunteers. We took 3D photos of their fa faces, uh, did a number of other measurements. Uh, we're now on the uh, 11th version of the software. We smoothed the photos a little bit, so this is the, the subject, and then this is the prediction straight from the genetic code. And so right now, we're just doing the face mask. If you look at the person next to you, the face mask is not the first thing that you use to recognize somebody. It's, it's their hair, it's uh, uh, other features. Here's a young man. Uh, here's the DNA uh, prediction. Uh, the more ethnicity in the background, the easier. Uh, here's a young African-American. And here's, here's his prediction. We can predict eye color and eye shape. We're not putting that uh, in these photos at this stage. Uh, these predictions predict your photograph just post-puberty. Uh, so a lot of people say, well, that doesn't look like me. I say, well, uh, find a picture when you were 16, um, and uh, it, all of a sudden they, they find uh, pretty good matches. So while we're trying to link all this together in the world's largest biological database, we're trying to make these diseases predictive, uh, proactive, and preventative. And we're trying to change medicine from being a clinical science supported by data to a data science supported by clinicians. Thank you very much. So we'll do a few questions. Madam. We have a mic. We have mic runners. Yes? Please. So um, thank you very, very much for the nice talk. There were a lot of results that I didn't know about. Um, so forgive me one somewhat more critical question. So basically, when I was hearing that, I was thinking about a lot of science fiction stories. Um, but at the same time, we're living in a world where um, people are more in risk of getting diseases when they have less money, when they're out of jobs. Um, a lot of people don't have access to healthcare. So basically, when you're at the like, forefront of, of the medical science, how do you deal with these social and moral questions? Yeah. So all things have to start somewhere. Uh, 
Uh, these machines are expensive. Medicine is expensive. I don't know what it's like in Germany. Uh, I think you have a single payer system here. Uh, in the US, people are not used to paying for health care themselves. So they have no idea what something costs. Unless you're outside the system, which Obama tried to change that, it's going the other way. So if you're in the poorer part of the country, any health care you get, uh, you have to pay for it yourself. Um, we're trying to design a system that can change how it's all done. Uh, it can save the US trillions of dollars a year by preventing diseases, detecting them early. Uh, and just with any other system that's backed uh, by third party payers, it can cover everybody. Because the money saved, the difference between treating a cancer patient like myself that was simple surgery versus treating me for 15 years with chemotherapy uh, and eventually early loss of life, there's no comparison in the costs. So uh, you, you can't say, well, here's a whole new system and approach. It costs a lot of money now. Uh, it's no good because we can't treat poor people with it. We can if you give you the money to treat poor people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a question of uh, where the resources are for medicine uh, and how they're being applied. It's got nothing to do with the technique. Other questions? All right. Beautiful talk, thanks. Once you have enough data on this genotype-phenotype relationship for humans to make for, for machine learning strategies to make sense of it, mm -hmm. they will probably be able to formulate what the ideal genome looks like. Is that going to be a prototype for humans then? Or? Well, I would bet my ideal might look different than your ideal. <laughs> <laughs> so mine was the first genome done in history. Uh, nobody's proposed so far that I've heard of making me the prototype human to model everything after. Um, so uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I think we will understand the range of phenotypes that arrive. Uh, we will be able to understand which environmental factors change those phenotypes and how they do it. Um, but I don't think it will uh, change uh, to cloned um, armies of identical humans. Uh, that happens socially now. We don't need to do it uh, <laughs> genetically. So I'm not too worried about that one. Okay, thanks. So, uh, over here. So, as you progress, over here. Sorry, sorry. Ah. So, as you progress with the artificial genome synthesis, uh, do you think the basic uh, eukaryotic genome would be without enhancers and, you know, these complex uh, other regulatory elements? Would you be able to synthesize it without enhancers or regulatory elements? I mean, of course, the, the, the later version would definitely include it, but, you know, can you remove some of this enhancer and will it still work? You were, we're talking about the human genome here. No, it doesn't have to be human genome, but as we go more complex from bacterial to the eukaryotic to further as we progress. Yeah. So even in the, uh, the simplest cell, our first synthetic cell has uh, RNA regulation molecules in it. And yes, as we go up to eukaryotes, the regulation gets more and more complex. Uh, we're going to have to understand that to design uh, and build a truly functional cell. Um, presumably that regulation is important for its survival. So uh, I don't think you're going to get a viable cell just stringing together coding regions. It doesn't work with viruses and hasn't worked with bacteria so far. So I really don't expect it to work with eukaryotes. Yeah. 
won't take up too much of your time. Thank you for the talk. What about psychological and emotional health and the burden of psychological and emotional problems? How do you tackle that through Health Nucleus? No, so it's a great question. So we do uh, extensive neurological testing, um, not necessarily testing uh, somebody's psychology, but testing neuronal function, uh, brain activity, et cetera. But uh, um, this is a system and a paradigm that you can apply to anything. So be careful to make sure you want to know the answer before you do the experiment. Uh, because if it's done right, um, we will find the genetic basis of every human behavior and trait. Uh, so you have to have your control group extremely well defined to get the right answer. Thank you. Um, so I wondered, do you think, it's here, um, do you think there's a unique minimal genome, or do you think that it might have depended somehow on the path you took, the genes you deleted or put back in, the order? Uh, yeah. Uh, for a given cell type, there's absolutely a unique minimal genome. For each, the order doesn't matter. We've done them in thousands of different orders, and we've shown that we can completely rearrange the gene order, so that does not matter. But if we were going to start the study all over again, say with the methanogen, we'd end up with a different set of genes as the minimal genome. So there's, it's, yeah. it's a minimal genome, it's not the minimal genome. But I don't mean exactly the order on the chromosome, but the order in which you took things away. Yeah. Order, but also you Doesn't didn't. seem to matter. No. Hi, if, uh, really nice talk. If you compare the genomic information with the lipidomics and the um, bio, uh, microbiote information, how much correlates with the genome and how much you can say is environmental uh, difference? So, if you think about trying to measure, you know, in the answer, nature versus nurture, that there's only one simple way that's even possible to do. We can measure what's nature, and by difference, everything else will be environmental. Uh, the environment is just too broad uh, to start trying to measure environmental influences without knowing the true answer for what's coded in our genome. Um, but we can see, in some cases, that there are other influences. Um, we are 100% a DNA software-driven species, but our DNA drives a lot of flexibility in the outcome of the answers. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, I'll keep going as long as you do. Okay. Young lady here. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm wondering if you collected any epigenetic data on the genomes that you sequenced. So, um, in some cases, we measure RNA seq, particularly on the tumors, to verify uh, the neoantigens or help to do that. Um, we looked at various protein measurements and we have not found anything that is robust, accurate, inexpensive, and works on high scale. Um, the same is true with DNA methylation. If I was going to measure something, I would measure DNA methylation on everybody. Um, everything else you can infer directly from, from the genetic code, so it's kind of a waste of money just to remeasure it. But DNA methylation, that thus far, uh, we don't know how to predict which sites will be methylated under different conditions. What I constantly remind people, especially in places where the epigenetics department is separate from genetics, is that epigenetics derives from that same genetic code. And people often forget that. So we have a question here. 
Uh, thank you for the talk. So um, I was wondering, this idea to basically have a sharp cutoff, I mean, not having the average lifetime prolonged, but the healthy lifetime, this seems a little bit counterintuitive because, I mean, people have to die from something eventually, and how can one know that the something will be abrupt? So, I mean, I can immediately believe that you can shift the curve. I don't quite see how you can make it sharp. Well, um... <laughs> Using something sharp, you can make it very sharp. Uh, but uh, w when people don't die from, quote, disease, they die from basically degeneration of all their processes. We can tell exactly how old you are by sequencing your genome. You know, it's like counting rings on a tree. We can count your age from the accumulation of mutations. So uh, if we want to live longer, we have to find a way to stop having our DNA mutated or find a way to have it be super repaired. But uh, flying from here back to Nantucket tomorrow, um, yeah, I'm gonna probably accumulate 40 or 50,000 new mutations. Um, if you sit in the sun for an hour, uh, you get about 20,000 mutations in your skin. Uh, most of those go away because every two weeks we replace our outer skin. So that, that dust in your house, that's you, and that's why you can never get rid of it. You're always making more, <laughs> right? So, so we have some systems that do try to correct for it. And that's why some of the work we did early on with Bert Vogelstein finding DNA uh, mismatch repair enzymes, uh, when those are mutated, there's a higher rate of colon cancer. So, um, but you're constantly getting bombarded uh, by radiation, uh, by, from chemicals, from things you eat. Um, and the number one risk for every disease is your age. So uh, you can die from natural old age just, you know, look at an old car sitting there not running, everything kind of rusts until it falls apart. Um, that's different than uh, having it die uh, as a new car because uh, the uh, carburetor, the computer chip failed. So, yes, we will all die from something. We're not trying to necessarily change that. Um, but we can see it. A lot of people, if you listen to the news every day, uh, actors, uh, musicians dying in their 40s and 50s, um, look in your high school or college yearbooks, you know, people die, most people will die before uh, they ever reach 80. Um, so I prefer to live as long as I can be healthy and still drive cars and ride motorcycles and things like that. Um, if, if I'm uh, confined to a bed and can't do anything, you know, it changes the quality of life of what you can do and whether you can contribute to society or not. So um, you know, some states, more states in the US are allowing for uh, um, assisted suicide. Uh, there's lots of ways to deal with people at the end stage of their lives without it just costing uh, an enormous amount uh, for the medical system uh, to prolong their lives when they don't want it prolonged. Thank you. I have a question. How much of medicine, of diseases, do you think you might predict from sequencing one genome? After all, I mean, uh, you know, due to epigenetic changes, but other uh, encounters, many diseases may result indeed in mutation, changes that occur in a given cell type that you might not have, you know, represented when you take uh, the blood, you know. And when you say one gene, you're saying one genome. Right. I'm talking well, about from have, one genome. Yeah, you have one genome. You, you sure. have you have a couple different lineages with minor variations in different tissues. Uh, if they're really important, they'll show up. Um, 
We haven't found too many volunteers that want to let, let us take brain biopsies and heart biopsies. Right. And if you'd like to be the first to volunteer, we can. Uh, we, <laughs> but we can, how much? We you can think see how you different will? it is from the blood to uh, to brain tissue. Um, but thus far, it looks like uh, uh, white blood cells are a good surrogate for the rest of the genome. That doesn't mean there weren't uh, somatic mutations. Uh, we find these in the mitochondria. We find these uh, if we sequence deep enough to look at lineages. But the only way to answer that would be to biopsy every tissue on everybody every time you're trying to diagnose a disease. So uh, we need to rely on a surrogate. And I think the data shows it's a pretty good surrogate. And we have one last question. Okay. Uh, what do you think the prospect is of understanding multifactorial, multi-gene diseases? Is that something that, that you must be very interested in that? I personally believe all diseases are multifactorial and multi-gene diseases. Uh, geneticists with finding so-called single gene disorders have kind of distorted scientific fact and uh, have overly simplified things because everybody with changes, even the same changes in the chloride ion channel known as the cystic fibrosis gene, some can have early onset, some late so onset, a huge range of symptoms. Um, it, my favorite misinformation is BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, that if you do not have a family history of breast or ovarian cancer, the best prediction you can get from BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene changes is a 50-50 lifetime chance of breast ovarian cancer. It goes up to the high 90% of every woman in your family has breast or ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. which means there's genetic pieces yet to be discovered that are the true factors that will predict breast ovarian cancer, not BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes. They're surrogates right now for what we don't know. All right, let's thank So thank you all for coming. And um, if you, you know, if you haven't seen the new center, um, they're doing tours today. If you want to see the cave and the microscopes, they're all running this afternoon. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you again for celebrating with us.